It's been my experience that uh, with regard to Tara, um, out of all of the different things, all of the different ways in which we can traverse a path towards liberation, there's a lot. There's a lot to choose from. There's a lot to be confused from. And it's been very helpful to me to see that pouring my mind and my intention towards this one figure at whatever level from the beginning I had and whatever level I'm at now, it's only been a, a benevolent and beneficial presence in my life. And to encounter that, um, is a tremendous refuge and a tremendous relaxation that there is at least one thing in the world that will not um, further embroil me in confusion or further um, create suffering and harm for myself. And that's remarkable. Um, I haven't I've had a, a lot of opportunity to reflect on Tara practice since you all asked me to, to share it with you. And, and that's one of the things that I really rest in awe with is, is that it will continue to evolve. And, um, but the, the, from the very beginning, just to have a statue or a picture um, to hold my mind on, you know, a, a simple Shine practice with Tara. Um, carrying it all the way to the nature of mind. All of it has been contained within this one outlet. Um, so I hope that through my own um, connection and inspiration that there's a little, pe a little piece of curiosity and um, interest for you all as well, whether it's Tara or Chenrezy or another one of these practices that are coming from uh, our teacher, uh, a teacher upon whom we can rely. Um, and I hope we don't take for granted any of that. Um, and <coughs> now I hope that you all have lots of questions so that we can continue for the next hour, uh, interestingly. <laughs> Be 
said she regulated from Chen Reagan to Reagan Chen Reagan's tears. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little more about that? Um so there's two different stories around the origins of Tara um, that ultimately don't have to be seen as different, but um, are ways of deriving inspiration for relying upon um, the divineness, the, the transcendent quality of, of Tara. So one story is that um, Tara was a human being. Um, she was born a princess called Wisdom Moon, Yeshi Dawa. And um, she was born with um, a propensity towards these qualities of kindness and um, a, 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 one, a compassion for other beings and a wisdom that saw the nature of things and wanted to um, become, uh, her, reach her full potential. And so she was purported to, um, you know, learn whatever spiritual practices were available to her at that time she was interested in and, and studied them. Um, and of course, in that era, it was mostly a male-dominated world and context, and, and those people with those opportunities to do a spiritual practice were also men. So here it was this uh, woman in that context, and there was a, a pivotal moment in which um, the men in that vicinity were saying, telling her, well, we see that you have all these qualities and you have all this interest to reach your full potential, but we really recommend that you not waste your time, um, but can contemplate the aspiration to be reborn in a male's body, and then you'll really be able to um, achieve enlightenment. Like, you'll really have the opportunities. Look at us. And um, at that point, she said, that no, she saw very clearly that there is no, um, there is actually no difference between men and women. First was her first statement that uh, that's an idea, a concept. There is no no one better or worse, no a better or worse. But because it is so rare that human beings aspire towards enlightenment in the female form, I vow from this moment until enlightenment, to always be born in a female form, um, and to always make this aspiration to be, become enlightened as a female, um, because she saw that that would be beneficial throughout all of these cultural contexts and whatnot. So, um, based upon those seeds of aspiration, um, she continued her practice and reached full enlightenment. Um, and then the other story is that um, out of Chen Rezi's compassion, his tears, tears being symbolic for his compassion, um, sh he gave birth to the form of drama and all of her qualities of activity um, to benefit beings. Would you say that <clears throat> Bokar Rinpoche's uh, little, in quotes, little book is the most accessible? Definitely. Oh, yeah. Kune, I wonder if it's still available. I think so. It's just a little, little book, like the Chen Rezi book and like the meditation book. Clear point press. Mm -hmm. right. Big text. You know, it's like, it's very straightforward sort of things, but I found um, in its essence it, it doesn't leave any of the profundity out you know it's just telling it as it is um, i think it has pictures of all 21 tars and it has drawing. that too yeah. drawings pictures. yeah pictures and uh, like 
I said, anecdotal stories that at the time that I was reading it, I was, it just rang true for me somehow. It was like, well, that seems impossible, but wow, <laughs> I'm going to keep doing this. So that's a that's a always a, a good thing to turn to um, inspirational inspirational things and enhance that quality. We have enough um, adherence to material, um, you know, what we touch, see, and feel being the ultimate. So whenever we can find extra inspiration for that extra thing, that mystery, um, <coughs> I'd say enhance that. Go for it. I um, I always uh, saw her or uh, in relation to like the earth in a lot of ways. And I, I can see that in, in one of the things that we went through. Can you maybe talk about how her being a goddess and relating to the earth, how that deals with liberating stuff from you? Because I've actually, in certain contexts, some like um, Qigong things. I've I've read a lot about how there are certain practices that kind of focus on like relaxation and letting like like uh, defilements kind of seep out of you and into the earth so that the earth can kind of you know purify it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of talk about maybe how her being connected with the earth relates to her being a liberator as well? Mm -hmm. So a couple things, um, the, the liberator, um, we always hark back to what we are seeking liberation from, um, and that might be very particular in any given session, um, and it might also be um, more universal, we're, liber we're looking, we're seeking liberation from um, our confusion uh, which causes suffering um, and in particular the qualities of Tara that offer that forth immediately um, are the qualities of her seeing in an instant the truth and if we contemplate Tara as seeing in that instant, the truth, um, we, and we are working on a relationship with that wisdom of Tara, then we all as well are receiving that instantaneous perspective. Um, and with regard to how that relates to the earth, um, we're already, I, we already identify, like even on a conceptual level, um, with the earth as a, a mother, as a creative force. You know, we look <coughs> at the, the everyday facets of nature as being a feminine principle because of its prolific, creative um, exuberance, mm -hmm. expression. Um, so those relationships to what just ha happens to be part of our um, ethos, you know, relating to the earth as this provider of, of, of food, shelter, you know, then we relate that, those qualities to what a mother is in terms of providing care, shelter, food, those, those sort of things. And when we realize that all of those safeties, all of that um, is provided for us, that we have that refuge, um, then we have the opportunity to <coughs> see things with that instantaneous look. Um, if we're stuck in a, an experience of feeling like we need something outside of us, for example, to complete us, or um, just even the confusion of feeling fear, 
you know, that's a, a the fundamental confusion is fear that we um, are able to be harmed. And given that there is no I to be harmed, um, you know, her wisdom sees through that appearance of a self that causes fear. So that's how she's able to protect from fear. But part of, um, you know, this is coming from all different perspectives, but one of the initial perspectives is that we have everything we need on a very practical level. And that's, uh, we can attribute that to the presence of this earth that supports our existence. You know, that's maybe one level is that we, we, we do exist. That's one perspective. We do exist and we're completely dependent upon the earth for our existence. And uh, we are completely dependent upon Tara for safety, you know, within that. And that's a, like I said, that's a perspective for a particular stage of the path. And that's useful because when we feel that we are safe, and protected, we have the opportunity and means to relax and recognize um, the space around which we've been missing this perspective. Sounds like the difference between relative truth and ultimate truth. Yes, and it's been my experience that I have no space to contemplate the ultimate truth if I'm caught in my confused fears and, and suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and spontaneity comes like when you're relaxed. There's mm -hmm. much more spontaneity. Mm -hmm. Not everything's measured. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so spontaneity has within it the wisdom of uh, no self, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not arising from a self. It's mm -hmm. a, a spontaneity um, there's there's a parallel there um, that we can relate the quality of spontaneity to this unborn, um, <coughs> this actionless action. Mm -hmm. Those those sort of these are words for something that is more of an experience. But um, just highlighting what you were tasting. So there's that aspect. And then um, there's a, a tradition of um, within Tibetan Buddhism and the corresponding um, origins back into the, the Indian Tantra of, of being in a um, everything's alive sort of experience. So what I mean by that is that um, we're not relating to objects as um, inert and um, insignificant. We're also not attaching ourselves to them as overly significant, but everything is a, a, a facet of consciousness. And there was an ease with relating to that in nature and if any one of us, any one of us has had this experience in nature where we have come into contact with something um, very clear and true and indescribable. If you haven't had that experience, feel free to say. Um, but every one of us has tasted a little bit of that and it's um, often been in nature and there's a, t a tradition, a long tradition of um, doing these practices in a natural retreat context um, and there's an experience of bodhicitta to take into account that there are no objects there's a continuity of consciousness with everything and everyone and uh, the aliveness of our environment is part of that um, the sacredness of the earth and um, the elements, like the whole way of conceiving of 
elements as uh, deities. There's a whole yeah, so tradition. Like, like, yeah. Uh, gets closely related to the darkness of the keys, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And Ella, we're in, you, you might, in the course of contacting a, a liturgy, see, you know, perpetuating the elemental spirits or, you know, pacifying the elemental spirits. Well, <coughs> that's a skillful way of, of turning our minds to the continuity we have. Um, we, we relate to consciousness in ourselves and in external forms, um, not so much to reify, but as a way to um, see the con the as a way to have access to the full breadth of our awareness. To have access to the full experience of awareness, um, not compartmentalized within our ego, mm. that sort of thing. Um, so I, I don't really have a lot of words for these things, so I hope it's not confusing to speak about it, but um, it is important to reflect on. Yeah. Um, this, uh, I really like that story. You did a great job. <laughs> in all, all your stories. The, I'm curious about how it fits in with the earth-touching mudra and uh, when Shakyamuni Buddha was under the Bodhi tree and was uh, was in the process of enlightenment. And I don't remember the details, but it seems like Mara said uh, said something. Who will who will vouch for this this Buddha who says he's enlightened here? And the earth said, "I will." Mm -hmm. Right? Is that mm -hmm. well? Or he touched the earth. Yeah. The earth okay. as my witness. A different way. I know that there are a lot of different ways of telling that um, <coughs> the meaning of that, and I don't know those ways, and I don't even want to try because they are so much better than mm -hmm. I've, I've I've recollected hearing um, some ah oh, yeah stories, but I don't know what those stories. I'd like are, to request so. that sometimes. I've never heard that story told by. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, the interpretation based on those perspectives, yeah. I'll see if I, 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 can, I can see if I can dig one of those up. Um, yeah, Thanks. yeah. Because that would imply a sentient being. Right. That Earth is alive. And it, it, so... Mean, you have a dialogue with it, right? It would just... So I, I, I mean, I really, this is a, an important practice for me. So mm -hmm. I don't, and it's implicit within um, the context of, of all of the rituals that we learn in um, the Kagyu lineage. Um, so I think it's important for us to explore that in a very direct way, just by going and being in uh, nature and listening. Um, we can go and experience the, the ritual aspect of um, being in harmony with the elements as well. And that's also interesting to go and do a fire puja at the monastery um, and you know watch the sky break forth into a rainbow. Well, that's kind of interesting, you know, what is that? It's a, it's a little bit, um, for me, it's something I watch again and again that I think is amazing, but it's different to go and, and sit and be in front of, um, just be with myself in a natural context and start to feel the aliveness of things as one with the aliveness of being and so i think all together blending those two has been really important to me and i encourage um, people to go and have that direct experience just by simply listening um, and then what we say about it the earth as a sentient being or you know the 
tree spirit or the dakas and dakinis, what we say about it is the art and the poetry about it. It's not it particularly. It's a way of, of really... Best attempt at yeah. describing it there. Yeah. yeah, and it's a way of sharing it and a way of, of um, perpetuate, like, of taking part in a group activity around it. Like if we didn't have a liturgy to chant about all of these things, and we wouldn't have the community aspect of, of making these prayers together. You know, we're, we're finding our forms um, in those liturgies. We're finding um, community in those liturgies. Um, but again, it goes back to having that direct experience and finding that for yourself. Um, that's really important. So, or it has been important to me. And, um, I've seen in the course of relating to that, others come into contact with those moments and t come back with, ah, aha, <laughs> you know. Well, now things aren't so fixed. You know, you get these direct, well, it, or, so much of our teachings are about direct experience because it, it, it seems to imprint an, another level of devotion or faith in how it works even in a limited way that we're still operating under, but you get these things that propel you forward to go, yeah, like if I do relax, if I, so it's, um, and you know, some of the folks here have heard about, the, I don't know if it's important to even share the connections that we've had that are direct experience because sometimes they're beyond words, but there's, you know, as you're talking about it, they just flashed, because you know, they were very, they felt very significant of like shaking up what you think is so solid. Um, I'll share one because <laughs> it still to this day helps me propel myself forward on how not everything is fixed and everybody's heard this already except maybe not you I don't know um, uh, we were in the night in the 80s we were in a beach house in Fire Island uh, Lisa and I and we used to walk on the beach we used to fast walk and it was one of these like pristine nights where the tide was low the sand was firm and the sky was the Pleiades were like hanging like you could just there was some kind of vortex. So we're walking to the next town over and we went to have a dinner. We come back, it was an hour and a half, it takes an hour and a half in the normal time. <laughs> we come back and the next thing I know, Lisa takes flight. She's like off the ground. There's something that sort of, sh and I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't, it was incredulous, like it felt incredible. And then I'm going next to her and the same thing happened to me. And we got to our destination in 30 minutes. And to this day, I said, did that really happen with each other? So it, it feels like it was a reminder. I feel, you know, it's not, it was magical. I mean, on some level it was magical because it's like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty dense. <laughs> it's not like you could just, but there was a vortex, you know, you kind of felt the elements aligning. I don't know how to put it into words that just m made you weightless, you know, had the experience of weightlessness. And there was a very, a lot of freedom in that experience of um, being flying, if you will. I mean, flying, it was like being supported by the Earth's, by the elemental energies, <laughs> you know, that just sort of took you and you were part of it. You know, you're not supposed to be attached to like phenomenon that happens, but it's, or, or the appearance of something happening, but that was a direct experience for both of us, and it was kind of cool that we both experienced this. Like, yeah, did that really happen? Did that really? Happen? And it's totally normal that if you if you have an experience like that, you're gonna want to have that experience again. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to have that experience again, you better sit and meditate, yes. <laughs> you know? or you know, mm, if you want to understand right. how that came to be, it's yeah. like a it's like a cosmic trick to get you to sit and meditate. <laughs> Those. Um, those experiences mm -hmm. and then it's, it is interesting to see there that not only are those experiences possible um, you know the capacity for us to have a vastly loving and compassionate heart is possible but we take that to be like something really like a big deal like this is you know this is something I will strive to accomplish um, but one of the things about interacting with uh, 
the Vajrayana and why it's like such a swift means is that part of our mindfulness is, is being, we are that. We, ha we are Tara. We are Chandrayuni. We, we have these qualities dormant within us. And we're going to turn our minds on again and again and go through that remembrance again and again. And so it's important to look at what, like, why do we resist that? Why do we, why do we even hesitate with something that could only be beneficial? It's a, a real question. Feel free to answer. <coughs> Force of habit. That's partly true, yeah. I mean, it might be ultimately true. No, it's not ultimately true. It might be a lot true, but it, the force of habit, too, is like nothing compared to Tara or Chen Z's like <laughs> swift Liberation. action, you know. The force of habit is overcome in an instant. And then another instant. And then another instant. <laughs> what does it say? Mistake by mistake. Nourishing, nourishing, yanda pe, nilam manjo. Mistake after mistake, we travel the unmistaken path. Are we still here? So if we have this energy and ability to focus our minds, we, we can all say we have some level of that, yeah? Even if we're focusing it on, you know, what we're going to eat for dinner or you know, the fact that that person just cut us off or the fact that we have a large credit card bill. like. We're focusing our energy at a certain point on any of those things. So we, re we recognize that our mind can do that. Our mind can do that. We have free will to choose what our mind does. And there's the nitty gritty part that it doesn't necessarily come without effort. We've got to apply the effort repeatedly to choose what our mind's focal point is. And um, let's, let's choose to, to expound on the qualities of, of the six paramitas. You know, understand those inside and out and remember them um, through the form of Tara or another skillful means that Vajrayana have a book, read it again and again. We're doing that sort of um, habit in other ways. We can do it in a new way. Um, but there's, there's really no need to wait. No need to wait to decide um, that we are worthy of compassion, worthy of loving kindness. And not only are we worthy, but that very worthiness is what springs forth as an un, unavoidable fruit of recognizing our worthiness is to see that in others. So anything that's not that, like just... Take up your mala, whatever it takes, you know, om tari tu tari tari so on, om tari tu tari tari so on, whatever it takes. Okay, challenge me, say something, question. Okay, I'm at a question. Yeah. Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is, it's a, I'm not just sitting here thinking of a hard question. It, it's something that occurred to me as we were going through this uh, earlier, uh, because I do recall reading uh, Bokhar Rinpoche's book a couple of years ago, 
one of the things I recall uh, was that, if I recall correctly, is that um, Tara was or is considered uh, the, an expression or the embodiment of uh, the perfection of wisdom of Prajnaparamita. And as I'm going through this, I'm looking for something there that would like indicate like why that's the case. I mean, I see that if you take the practice set in total, it's kind of, well, almost any practice you could say is Prajnaparamita, an expression of Prajnaparamita. I mean, one thing I'd like to say is that it does seem like Tara, Tara practice is the most complete, at least strikes me from the practices I've come in contact with, and I can see how they're all equal on a certain level. You know, you, get, you can do one or do the <coughs> other, and you're going to get ultimately the same benefit. But Tara, of course, is designated as this expression of Prajnaparamita, and I don't see it. I mean, I can see how you get there through the practice, but why is it not there? Or, ev ah. or evident to you. Yeah, why is it not evident to me? Or, or you can point out how, if it's evident to you, point out to me what's, yeah. where it is. So, what is Prajnaparamita? Good question. It is, I would say, um, the ultimate expression of uh, the enlightened mind, or uh, uh, the recognition that there is um, of the emptiness of all phenomena, and that there's no path, there's no self. I mean, that sort of, in a nutshell, I mean, you could go on for 10,000 lines in the case of the, the sutra. Um, so any, any practice of the Vajrayana involves um, creation and completion. And mm -hmm. the completion phase blends into the creation phase over the course of practicing. They're not indivisible anymore. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is Prajna Paramita. Along with that, if you want specific um, you know, phrases or, or something. Is that what you're looking for? Like a well, I mean, but see what you just described, though, is something that I, oh. is true of yeah. every practice, mm -hmm. though, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the essence of these practices is to, in some sense, dislodge your sense of self, <clears throat> your, your, you know, your connection to what you identify as yourself, and replace it with this deity, and you become the deity, and thereby sort of dropping... You know, as part of it is dropping yourself. Um, or is that or fair? another or way of saying it is, is just to see that there's a flexibility with which you arise. Sure. And, sure. and recognizing there's a flexibility with which you, who you identify yourself to be. You see the emptiness of who you are, mm -hmm. and then. Um, but by seeing the emptiness, you begin to let go of, and, and it's not so much that you you don't have a self anymore. It's your attachment to that idea of a self is what uh, dissolves. Mm -hmm. And I'm just asking why this particular practice is considered that way, if you agree. I mean, maybe you can disagree. Oh, I don't, I think that um, you go through hearing what Prajna Paramita is and what she is and what she is and what she is, it's many different things. You'll hear that phrase, that turn of phrase with relationship to a lot of different things. Um, so it doesn't narrow it down that this particular practice um, and others aren't. I don't think that's what that was saying. Um, but it's more of a an inspiring phrase to say that within this, you have the perfection of wisdom. To practice this, you receive the perfection of wisdom. And then she herself is an embodiment of the perfection of wisdom. And that's like a... a that's, so in other words, it's no big deal. It's a tremendous big deal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing to, to, to blend our mind with, at first, just looking at this outer deity that's like paint on a tanka to the, the end result being Prajnaparamita. 
Yeah. Yeah. But Krishna yeah. Paramita, on, uh, as, as experienced, is something quite ordinary, though. So. Right. So it's both it's a, a big deal and it's not. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we have to, to have the energy to go through this. Oh, get excited. This is a big deal. This is, you know, the, we have the, the, the liberation in the palm of our hands. You know, this is, this is the, the way of um, uh, the teachings in Tibetan Buddhism. You get, you get worked up. This is a tremendous blessing. We're not, it's not about us and how we do it. It's about the fact that, you know, we have all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas arriving for us through the form of our teacher, through this form of an amazing um, thing to behold and take beauty in. Um, and how, how do we have any time to waste? How do we have any time to feel tired or, or less than about it? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous big deal. And then as you go, it's like completely ordinary. And it, it's not, you know, anything. It's just every day, this is uh, what I was trying to allude to in the beginning. It's completely ordinary. Sounds like, I heard this described similarly about something different, but it sounds like at the moment of awakening to it, it's amazing and you're amazed at it, but at the same time, the reality of it is that it was like that before you awoke yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. Like, this is like the constant state of things. It's just that you're going through a process of realizing it. Mm -hmm. And from that springs compassion, because it's like that for everyone. And we could go through this thing of not seeing it. So, yeah. When Thomas Edison first discovered electricity, I mean, it was always there. And then, so there was probably an excitement about the fact of harnessing something that could create a whole other evolutionary way that people were either reading by reading or having better, you know, all the qualities of electricity, and it always existed, and, you know, then it became sort of this universal, ordinary way of that, you know, we, but it helps to, I don't, know, I don't know what he felt about it when he found it, <laughs> tapped into it, it made me think of that. And then we, we just take it for granted, right? We just flip the switch. Well, and I don't know if we'll ever take for granted the qualities of enlightenment. You know, in, the t in terms of the ordinariness, I, I, I haven't gotten to that point where I take for granted mm -hmm. the qualities of, of enlightenment. I think that the fact that you still so see suffering is why you don't. Mm -hmm. But I also think that, so a lot of the things about when they talk about different realms and like there are the God realms, and it seems like they in a way almost do, but it's not, not they're not technically enlightened though right. because they're experiencing so much joy that they're not, they're not conscious of the level of suffering that occurs for, mm -hmm. for other beings in other realms, you know. And they still believe in themselves and don't realize they are impermanent. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're almost like reflecting back on your own qualities when you're doing the deity practice who becomes you, but not you, the self, the clinging self, but the qualities of the uh, potential. So you're invoking it and then you're becoming it and you're blending with it and it's you all the time. I don't think you have to w worry too much about, but not you. That part you don't have to add. That's part of like arriving in, in the context of this. You just go with the, the, the wave of this. There's not a point in this that says you become Tara, but not the Tara that thinks that she is Tara or whatever. You just... Well, the words are, and you're inseparable from Tara. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, there's, there's specific words, um, but <coughs> what I mean, what I'm getting at is that you go through it, and then you go to correct or counteract the clinging to a self. You go through another process that's also not saying, don't cling to this. It's just a process of seeing that there is nothing to cling to. 
so you can go through it with and it's suggested um, you know divine pride the pride of the deity confidence like direct directing confidence and clarity towards seeing yourself as Tara is not a hazard if you're really following the, the liturgy to the point <laughs> in which you do the completion phase and there is nothing there you know there's nothing to hold on to there is a hazard I think and and um, a potentially short-lived hazard in thinking you are Tara and like going around, you know, dressing up like her and, you know, pr promising to liberate beings, you know, that, that won't last. <laughs> but there is that possibility that this that? could be inter <laughs> interpreted <laughs> as... Did you have the direct experience? Did you try Personal experience. <laughs> I didn't have to go through that personal experience. <laughs> But I, I, I guess I could share, I could share a little bit. Um, so when I was uh, 19, I, one of the pivotal moments for me to even, you know, like you were flying, that, that moment was pivotal and you wanted to figure maybe could that ever happen again. When I was 19, I had a, a few months in which, um, it could probably be called a psychotic break, basically. But my experience, my insides were being un, un, indistinguishable from what was happening outside of mm -hmm. me. And it didn't strike me that that was odd until there was no one else inside of that experience and to like validate it. You know, people are like, you know, this is not actually true for us. You know, it might be true for you. Um, but within that context, um, you know, the mistake was thinking that it was true or real. And so um, the wisdom of it was seeing that the mind was creating what I was seeing and, and having that, you know, blatant, blatantly obvious to me that um, it was nothing I could see the, the relationship between my thoughts and what was happening outside. And that was the first time I had ever really witnessed that in such a colorful way. Um, but going through the pain of taking that to be some ultimate truth, which I did. I mean, it was like, wow, you know, you can really get lost in that experience. You can be like, this is great. I am doing this. I am creating this. I am the center of the world, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of perspective. And there's the mistake, like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I am doing this. I created this, all of that. And so it was very painful to, to go through that um, process of seeing that um, that wasn't the end of it. You know, that wasn't the end of suffering. Like, just because that was, that was the first thing is that, oh, I'm creating this so I could create something, you know, perfect. You know, I could create the, the beautiful, harmonious, love-filled universe that everyone belongs to. Well, <laughs> um, so I learned that when I was young and then I was humble um, to discover that that's not the end of it. Um, and also inspired to discover, well, there is uh, this capacity of the mind that I'd like to understand. How is this working? How is this projection machine happening? Um, but that's what I mean by short-lived. Like, the, the hazards of this, I think, are short-lived if, if you go out thinking that you are going to be some special deity saving beings, you'll have reality to show you <laughs> the limits of that hallucination. <laughs> and then it just comes back to like the ordinary things that you do and experience, the ordinary ways in which you can um, see 
your own thoughts and others' expressions with equanimity, non-judgmental mind, loving kindness, compassion, all of those moments that we, we neglect to cherish because I don't know, why do we neglect to cherish those moments as opportunities? Not thinking about other stuff. Because we get caught up in the suffering of samsara. <laughs> the ego doesn't want to let go. It's just like the ego just going, at, you know, protecting. Like, in, like you said before, there's nothing to fear, you know, and then there's all this protection sometimes. And you see it happening. You see it, for, you know, you. You're witnessing your own uh, armor. Yeah. And alarms yeah. and whistles going off. Yeah, like, is this it's like you're witnessing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you witness your own mind. I think we, we think that impermanence doesn't apply to us. Mm. But uh, we'll always have a chance to come back and play in that same playpen. And uh, it doesn't work that way. I think it's like really funny though because it's such a mind trick on yourself because you can, mm -hmm. I mean, through your own experience, you can see people that you know going through it and it's like, they're they're not permanent and I know them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I don't know, I just think it's weird yeah, that you would, you would still somehow think yourself into that box. Well... So there's this habit of existing or not existing, and the flexibility, the, the gray area, is like, it really requires you to be completely vulnerable, like letting go, <laughs> letting go and letting go, and what that feels like before you actually do it, it feels like you are on the edge of the cliff Terrifying. about to die over and over again. So you just, you know, first just recognizing that you can take that leap, but that's a mindfulness in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense that we go through that process because <clears throat> until we've really examined the fear at that edge, it just lives as this, like, oh my God going to die sort of unconscious but th using the body um, has been helpful to me so um, stabilizing within the con constitution of my body the experience of that fear uh, if that makes sense like seeing, I, I can actually feel, and when you when you're s sitting with yourself around those challenging experiences, those times that you don't want to let go and you don't want to see something um, completely unknown. Like we we all have some situation where we're aware that we could take a leap, but there's something in which we hold off, we we keep back, and if we looked at that moment, that decision, that decision moment, there's a corresponding feeling in the body. Mm -hmm. And if we looked at that feeling in the body, there's a, an opportunity to relax. And the feeling of the body that is willing to let go is actually like a feeling of feeling the body relax around it. The feeling of not willing to let go and wanting it to be defined, wanting to know what's going to happen next, is a feeling of holding on and contracting. And you can actually examine that on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, this opening and contracting within the somatic experience. Um, and that's, that's uh, informative. That's, that, that says... Well, is the, viscer is the visceral nature really an expression of it, or is that a learned habit, too, that you could you contract? You know, that could be a, that could be learned as well. You know, my throat closing every time, I, you know, for example, because that becomes a habitual, can, 
habitual tendency too. Does the body lie? Is the body like so? I mean, here. Well, I think what you're saying is good to clarify that mm -hmm. um, the the body, the embodied response, mm -hmm. is not true either. Mm -hmm. That's why when you examine it, you when you look at it, you see that it's it's impermanent mm -hmm. and changing. And you see that the embodied response may be triggering mm -hmm. the conceptual response or the, mm -hmm. the action and the choices you make, but that it just started as a feeling mm -hmm. and that the feeling has no, no, you can't like hold on to a feeling. You can't find it or locate it anywhere in particular. Even when you look and you maybe, or at first you can, but then when you look deeper, like how is this happening? There's nothing, there's no edge, there's no center, all of it, pointing to emptiness. So then you can start to say, oh, this isn't as real as I thought it was. This isn't as, you know, life or death as I thought it was. Um, and you, you can act out of that place and further enforce that new knowledge, that new awareness, that there's, there's a choice. If the intention is is that, because you can distract yourself away from that too. You know, if you're piercing something and looking at it, um, you can distract away from what was originally calling your attention by. Um, well, you, you know, won't if, if you if if you're I'm, I'm the the. That's why we don't. That's why we have to stable. You know, there's the sh sh mm -hmm. shine shamata. Because then it's a lot easier to hold on to the, the, mm -hmm. the slipperiness mm -hmm. of wanting to hide mm -hmm. from those mm -hmm. direct experiences. Mm -hmm. So then when we go to look directly and have an insight about something, the opportunity to be distracted is not available. Mm -hmm. That level of meditation, <clears throat> after the initial one where you're relaxing and everything, is that what they talk about when they talk about like sitting within the feeling? Like not 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 um, getting wrapped up in it, but just observing it, observing what's going on. Shine is even before. Yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> yeah like shine is like is like the the like getting yourself relaxed so that you're able to to actually start to observe feelings and emotions and mm -hmm. not not become overwhelmed by them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, finding a still point or your center. Mm -hmm. And then taking the the smaller waves on the path before going for the hardest and heaviest <laughs> of the emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, starting off small. Yes, I need to. Oh yeah. Where are we? Okay, two fifty. Mm. So. Um, what do you, what do you, what next? We will, what have we well, left out? We will, well, we will dedicate the merit, of course. Well, of course. <laughs> but before we dedicate the merit, is there anything we haven't um, fully responded to that wants to be spoken to today? Yes. Um, you've done a remarkable job of presenting this um, with great clarity. Uh, as a teacher, I can say you've progressed greatly as a teacher yourself. Um, this has been a wonderful presentation. The fact the work that you put into this to make it so nice and clear is wonderful. Um, your ability to share um, is, is so uh, beneficial for the sanghas that you come to, because I can't imagine it would be any different for the other sanghas as well as ours. And I would imagine also for the individual people that you meet, unless you happen to stop at a rest stop or something <laughs> like that. But um, it is, um, Rinpoche must be very proud of you. <laughs> well, that was very kind. Very kind, and thank you for having me here again and, and giving me the opportunity to share something. Um, every time I'm asked to to put to words 
um, a practice like this or an experience like this, um, I'm learning anew and seeing things uh, in a different way and more clearly seeing where I'm not seeing things as clearly and needing to see more clearly. So it's um, more of a gift to me um, when, when you all are asking and um, I, I hope that anything I've said that isn't helpful at all just goes in one ear and out the other and everything that touched even the smallest bit of inspiration in you grows and continues to keep you buoyed throughout any doubts or fears and that you always know uh, that as a basis for your appearing here in this world it's your pure goodness and indivisibility with the qualities of Tara and all of those beings that we look up to. <laughs> goodness, I'm going to cry. Thank you for taking the time yeah. to be here. <clears throat> Oh, we have a we have a, a, a Dharma family. These these connections they they will carry on. So let's dedicate the merit. And before we chant the traditional phrases of dedication I just like to settle back into our seat and taking this opportunity to <coughs> recollect that initial longing that we carried at the beginning of this session. And allowing that longing to blend at the heart space with the fullness and gratitude for our awakening mind that carries us forward infallibly, mistake after mistake. The preciousness of this experience, this life. And connecting in the heart space with the longing of all beings, all beings longing for happiness and freedom from suffering. And from the fullness of our present being, this benefit that we've cultivated here today, extending that to all beings like rays of light, just giving it away freely and completely. Seeing that we have an inexhaustible gift in the act of giving. And then we'll chant the traditional dedication. Chegana <laughs> 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 